Good morning. Good morning. So finally, this morning, we're going to examine some passages and reflect on the ideas, the principles, the intellectual style of the 48 Laws of Power, which is by far the most successful Machiavellian book of the last 25 years at this point. If by any chance there is time at the end of this introduction with the analysis of passages, I will continue where I left on Monday, go back to The Prince and talk about chapter three, but I want to be a pessimist on Monday. I only went through one out of three points that I had in mind. We'll see. Otherwise, I'll resume the analysis of the prints later on. This that you have on the screen is the PDF document to which you should have access through your Stony Brook login. And if you have any issues, please let me know. As you will see, I've included passages, pages from the introduction to the book. And for the 48 laws, I've included only some, and in some instances, you just find the judgment, which is the formulation, the expression of the law. In other instances, such as law 21, you find almost everything that you would find there. Of course, if you decide to pick this book as the focus of your final paper, I would recommend that you get the whole book either online in electronic format or you find it in a library and take it out on loan so that you can study it and examine. I will later on spend more time on a Friday possibly talking about the final project and reviewing the section that you find in the class weekly about the final project and the suggested template but the kind of work I'm doing this morning already is a kind of modeling of the approach that you, you should follow. That is to say, I'm trying to identify key passages in this text, and then I'm trying as best I can to compare the ideas to Machiavelli's ideas. In some instances, although not exactly for this book, that is, is more applicable to other books, in some instances, your, work, your, your task is to identify specific passages that you can compare to, in Machiavelli, that you can compare to a book. Christine, you have a question or a comment? Oh, no, sorry. Oh, sorry, no, no. I, I thought you were. Oh, no, sometimes I just put my hand like this. Oh, no, that's fine, that's fine. No problem, okay. So, I put 2000 because this is the edition that I own, but the book, came out in 1998. It is a different kind of book. You understand that from the fact that in the frontispiece you have the name of the author, Robert Greene, wrote the book, and the other name is not the name of a co-author, rather is the producer of the book, better yet, the designer of the book. Robert Greene had in mind for a long time, he had the desire, the, the plan, to write a book about power. And he talked about different people. Then he met Jules Alpers. He said, prepare a pitch for me. Come and pitch the book for me. And he liked the idea. Alpers is not a publisher. It does not work for a publishing company. But he liked the idea and he said, this book can be a successful book if we design it in a certain way. And that's how, through the intervention of this editor, although we're talking about a higher level editor, not someone who uh, changes words in a sentence, thanks to his help, you have the idea of the 48 laws. Why 48? Simply because it's a nice round number, right? It's like the 
57 varieties of Heinz tomato ketchup, right? And by the way, where are the other 56 varieties? Because I only find one or two on the shelves of a supermarket. It was just a marketing ploy by Heinz at the end of the 19th century because he saw other kinds of product being advertised that way, 21 styles of a shoe, for example. That's the example he mentions in his writing. And he came up with the idea that if I say 57 varieties, it doesn't matter whether I have fewer or, or more, it sounds appealing. It sounds, makes the product more interesting, makes the marketing easier. So that's how you have 48 laws. They could have been 36, 72, they like that number. Besides that, you will be able to see from the book itself, as I said, my excerpts are uh, cutting out a lot of the material, but you can see that each law follows a template whereby you start by the expression of the judgment. They didn't call it a law, even though it's the laws of power, the template starts with a judgment, which is in fact, the formulation of a law or the description of a strategy, a practice, a behavior, and goes on with various forms of examples. It can be the transgression of a law with a negative example of someone not following the law, not following the judgment, not going by the judgment and paying the consequences. It can be the confirmation an example that confirms the law, then you have key points, key ideas, you have the reversal. So if the judgment is correct, what is the reversal telling us about what not to do, etc. So each law follows a template or a design that is clearly educational. That is to say, Elfers turn a book which might have been a nerdy intellectually book because if you see Robert Greene on the internet, he's a nerd for lack of a better term or you, you, you could diagnose him psychologically as special and, and you can easily find the, the kind of syndrome he suffers from. I, I can say that because I'm special. My mother told me so and so I, I know that. And what might have been a nerdy book turned into something that is packaged in a way that makes the content easy to access and also creates the illusion that you can actually learn things from this book because it's laid out so clearly and the key points, the laws, the counterpoints, everything is uh, uh, spread out nicely for you to consult follow, imitate, etc. Now, before we get into the analysis, what is the one thing that Machiavellian books, not just Robert Greene's, but other books published in the name of, or with the name of Machiavelli during the last 50 or 60 years will not be able, will not will be willing to do? There is a limit to the application, a hard limit to the application of Machiavellian laws. And there is a reason why Machiavelli is talking about politics. That is to say that if you go back to the schema that I drew on the blackboard, when you talk about power and you want to use power in the form of control, right? Because power can be in many things. For example, power can be the power to create, the power to enable people, right? But Machiavelli doesn't focus on that kind of power. He focuses on power as control. When you deal with that, you have always to include both natures, both sides of the schema, both natures of control. That is to say, indirect control, which is influence, authority, even manipulation, and direct control, which is force, deterrence, etc. And no modern book will usually 
take the path of suggesting that without the use of force, which again can be direct or indirect. And keep in mind that when I talk about the use of force, I'm not implying that you should have on the bookshelves a book that says that you need to be violent, that you need to point a gun at someone or kill someone the same way that Machiavellian leaders such as Cesare Borgia did or had done, had it done uh, by his soldiers or by mm, their accomplices. I'm just saying that there are only two areas in society, really, where the totality of the Machiavellian model of power can be found applied and applied with a considerable degree of success. And those are politics, because politics, even in a democracy, tends to be Machiavellian, lends itself to that kind of game, and you can play a, a, a successful Machiavellian game of politics for several years or even several decades, and leaders from generation to generation have been able to do that. Again, there is no guarantee that uh, you, that your political Machiavellian strategy or game will uh, preserve your position of power forever. And, and, and Machiavelli is clear about that. But you can actually do it. You can actually find examples of such leaders. The second best area where the Machiavellian schema or model in its entirety can be deployed is organized crime. Outside of those two areas, you can only find partial models. And any kind of self-help Machiavellian book will insist mostly on the indirect use of power, on influence, manipulation, on establishing your authority. However, Machiavelli eventually will say, will have to say on this kind of situation that there is only so much control that you can establish and retain in a context by using influence, by using a form of power that is indirect. That is to say, if you accept the premise to Machiavelli's book to be, here I give you, all oh, readers, a system that will allow you to acquire, retain control over the outcome in any context, if you accept that to be the premise of Machiavelli's ideology, then almost nothing that you find in this book will guarantee that. Because sooner or later, you'll have to face a context where influence is not enough for you to have control over the outcome and some kind of force or even just deterrence will uh, be necessary. And again, by force at this point in the 21st century, you have to put in the list of instruments of force, not just soldiers, the police force, or your own, uh, your availability of, of a gun, the, the fact that you have, you can beat someone with a stick or uh, uh, use a gun against them. I'm talking about other means of force, including the ability to send someone to jail, or at this point, the ability to limit someone social freedom, right? If you have the power, the authority to freeze, to block someone's bank account, that is force. That is force, right? There is no gun involved, there is no violence involved, but that is force. That is a forceful way of controlling. And of course, you can understand what I'm referring to, uh, what country, what leader, what situation, okay? And that is just one example of a modern form of force. It's not influence, it is force. 
lacking that side, then sooner or later, you'll find yourself in a situation where control is limited. The other basic objection, so to speak, so to speak or, or if you will, the basic <coughs> criticism, uh, don't, don't destroy the classroom. <laughs> no, sorry, it's a joke. Um, the other basic criticism you can levy at Green and most other books is that they have at least a partial understanding of the notion of a context. That control is only related to a context, right? That when you talk about control, it's not control over everything. It's always control in a given situation, right? However, they tend to make their laws universal or of wider application compared to Machiavelli. They want to convince the readers that their book, their ideas are so useful that the applicability of those ideas knows no boundaries. And this contradicts another basic principle and a key to the innovation brought by Machiavelli that every time you talk about a political practice or a social practice that you can call Machiavellian, it happens in a specific context. And control has to be measured in that context. Because only if you create, identify a context with some kind of boundary, which can be porous, open to external in in intrusions. It can be a context that is part of a larger context and therefore is not completely insulated. However, there has to be a context to play that kind of game because only within the kind of context, control is finite. And therefore, I know how much control I have and how much control the others have. And it's a win-lose kind of game. Machiavellian, a Machiavellian game is a traditional game. It's win or lose. It cannot be a win-win game. There are other games that are, can be win-win or lose-lose, right? So if you take politics in general and you apply it to society, the totality of society, then you cannot think of power within that context, political power, as a pizza that you can slice only so many times, right? And therefore, if I cut my pizza in eight slices and I'm the leader and I'm giving four slices to the voters, to society in general, I'm left with four only myself. And if I give them six, I'm left with two slices myself. That would be a... Uh, uh, simplistic view of power. If you take the game of politics, if you take the whole of society, then politics can become a win-win game, right? Such as, and this is not uh, the idealistic view of our century, it is in fact something, an idea, an approach that has been tried in several formats since the end of the 19th century. The idea that if you educate your citizens correctly in a society, if you empower them through education and opportunities, then the sum of the power in a society increases. So it can be a win-win situation because to extend my metaphor, you can think of politics not as one oven, where I make one pizza, and then here I have eight slices. How many of you are? Well, I'll give you two slices. You deal with that, and I'll keep the other slices for me. It's not a one oven game. It's a game where I say, okay, people, you each build your own oven, and then we end up with 20 pizzas, okay? It can be that way, and governments, modern governments have tried to play that game a number of times, in fact, we'll see later on in the semester a good example of this through a book by H.G. Wells, the famous science fiction writer who also wrote the new Machiavellian talks 
about that kind of gains of efficiency, where you can grow power in society by treating citizens in a different way, especially through education. Of course, at that stage, we're talking about the early 1900s, what's the end result of that game? What happened right after, just a few years after H.G. Wells' book, The First World War? So that game was growing power in society to make society a stronger economy, a stronger industrial nation, so that you can build more weapons and win over other nations, play the game of imperialism within Europe or colonialism over the global uh, scene, okay? So that was one version, one format of that game. And, and, and then later on, past World War I, fascism and national socialism in Central Europe and Southern Europe Communism in the Soviet Union tried to play that game, another version of that game. But again, if you think of politics in general, or society in general, you cannot say power is finite, and therefore, if I accumulate more power, you have less, and I have control. Machiavelli never suggested that. Again, it would be a very simplistic kind of conception of politics. What is key to the understanding of Machiavelli is that Machiavelli always refers to one context. And within that limited context, once that context is some kind of subset of a totality of society and politics, within that context then, there is no enabling others. It's a matter of control. Therefore, if I gain more control, you have less control. And that's how, within that context, I can control the outcome, or I can even control other people, okay? And again, the fact that everything has to be connected to a context and limited to that context, whereby only within that context and as long as that context is stable, I will have control. In that regard, Robert Greene's book and other books are limited in their understanding of Machiavelli. And if you look at the relationship between control and a given context, then you understand also the finite nature of Machiavelli's con concept of uh, control. The idea that you cannot extend your control for the longest period of time. Because the context will evolve. The context will change. If you think of the context as an ecosystem, other predators will enter the ecosystem, for example. Or the prey will develop skills. The birds will become faster than, or the rabbits will become faster than the foxes, for example, right? Will outrun the foxes, the, the surviving rabbits, in a, in a model ecosystem where evolution happens quickly, etc. But you understand that Machiavelli cannot guarantee control and power in general. And therefore, once the game is played within a different context, you need a different set of skills, which you might not have. You need to adapt in some way or another. And we will see uh, soon the uh, chief example, the, the best, the ideal leader for Machiavelli, who is Cesare Borgia, who's presented at the beginning of chapter seven as the perfect leader, and heavily criticized at the end, saying, well, he failed and it's his fault. Of course he failed, because the context changed. You have to read the chapter correctly, otherwise you'll think that Machiavelli started writing chapter seven with a fiasco of Chianti by his side, and by the time he wrote the conclusion, he had so much red wine in him that he forgot how he started the chapter and wrote a conclusion that is perfectly the, the perfect antithesis is of the, the, the initial thesis, okay? No, it cannot be. It's all about contexts. There were initial contexts, initial ecosystems for which Cesare Borgia was the perfect man, had the right skills, was able to control those ecosystems, and he failed to recognize when his father died that the new game, which was 
whom do I want as the successor of my father? Whom do I want as the Pope? Because I'm operating as a leader within the region controlled by the influence of the church. And he didn't play that game correctly. Why? Very simple, because Cesare Borgia was a certain kind of cruel leader, was better at lying, cheating, killing his competitors. But the game of the election of a pope is a more subtle political kind of game. And the implication in the conclusion of that chapter will find is that if Cesare Borgia didn't have the right skills for that game, he should have brought in the necessary resources. That is to say, a mind such as Machiavelli's mind. Someone to be his consigliere in that kind of war, someone who could give him the right kind of advice to continue to have control. But again, there is no context, there is no ecosystem that will continue to remain the same without significant changes for more than a few hours or a few minutes for a con or a few years or a few decades. And eventually the changes in the ecosystem will be such that the ecosystem, the context will change and will not be a good match for the skills of the predator of the leader of the Machiavellian leader in that context and therefore failure will be inevitable okay and there is no universality to Machiavellian laws the same way that you find these books giving you laws oh believe me this is what you have to do no matter what okay let's go through some of these passages I have highlighted them and maybe I can continue to do so with this pen so this is the preface, the introduction, and it goes right away into talking about power, defining it as power over people and events. Now, what I'm doing, as I said before, I'm trying to translate this into Machiavellian terms, and I'm trying to compare this to Machiavelli. And right away from the first line, I find something that is heavily reminiscent of Machiavelli, right? Because once I define power as power over people and events, I know that we're talking about control, essentially. Not the power to make things, not the power to change, not the power to create. Power over is control. So, yeah, giving it a start, I recognize that the system starts with the principle that an idea that is intrinsically Machiavellian. Then I find no one wants less power. Well, again, I'm talking about something that resonates. I'm reading something that resonates with me, right? Because as I said before, not in society in general, but within a context, power is finite in the terms, in if you interpret power to be control, right? Within a well-defined context, if I have more power, if I have more control, it means that you have less control and vice versa. So even this is something that we can understand, agree and approve. Then of course, it goes into a disclaimer. And the disclaimer itself is kind of obscure. And the disclaimer, goes by saying it is dangerous in this society to seem to power hungry to be overt with your power moves but what the end goal of this kind of reasoning that will be appearing through several passages of the preface is once again that in this kind of society in our kind of society you cannot recommend people the use of force basically, right? But there is a limit to the amount of power you can deploy in a social setting without being seen as the oppressor, without being seen as the harasser, the violent person, etc. Which is fine, of course, which is fine. The problem is that you cannot really 
fully apply Machiavellian laws to individual lives and to most social settings. And that's why I said only people who can access force legally or illegally, organized crime or politicians, can play a full Machiavellian game. And then anybody else can be a partial Machiavellian, but there is no partial Machiavellian. Either you are or you aren't, right? So it's just another way to say that Machiavellian laws cannot really be applied to the lives of individuals and the context played by individuals, with very few exceptions. Okay, so he says we have to seem fair and decent, which is another way, meaning you cannot attack people, you cannot threaten people in a social setting, right? That, that kind of suggestion is out of the way, but at least you find the admission that Machiavelli would want you to do that. At least there is that recognition. Yes? And there's the, like, the use of the words like, to seem too power hungry, to be overse. It sounds like he's really focused on presentation there, how you look. Image, people. right. Yeah. Which is a, a, another deeper understanding of Machiavelli because Machiavelli throughout The Prince is concerned with image, which is beautiful because it's so modern. Because Machiavelli could have, could have said, you are Cesare Borgia, you are a ruthless leader with a powerful personality, with a powerful army, with powerful allies. Your father is the, the Pope. <clears throat> Your father's friend, best friend, is the King of France. So who's there to stop you? And Machiavelli will instead insist there is a natural boundary to your exercise of power and control. That is to say that if people, even if you have absolute power, if people think that you are a hateful, cruel leader, and they are not just afraid of you, but they hate you, then you're not playing a good game. Because then you'll be, your game will be costly. Because you'll be forced to use force and other means of direct control all the time and eventually you run out of resources or you will ruin the game played by the people. What's the game played by the people? Being better off, as you find at the beginning of chapter three. That is to say, grow economically. And grow society in that sense, create more resources. Without that growth, even when you have absolute control and obedience, you cannot have enough power because you need resources, you need the economy to grow so that you can take some of the resources and shift them and apply them to the army, to your foreign politics, etc. Without that, even with complete internal control, you are, you are doomed on the international scene. And the best example of that, of course, is the Soviet Union. Up until the 1990s, perfect control inside, right? Very few opposition, none that mattered. However, complete stagnation of economic growth. And without that, the Cold War was won by the United States because the USSR was not rich enough in resources to keep producing tanks, ships, air carriers, uh, atomic bombs, rockets, etc., etc. Okay, so it's a very modern approach tried by Machiavelli. Even when you have absolute power, even if you're Hitler, you need to preserve your image because influence is the most inexpensive way to one, gain the support of the majority of the people, two, gain the confidence of the people. Without that confidence, the people will not be productive. Without productivity, you will not have the resources to play any kind of uh, international case, okay? And this next part develops that by talking about cost and duplicity. So you, according to Machiavelli, you can actually be duplicitous, right? Or you may have to, because in some instances, as we suggested, the prince has to be cruel, even if they don't want to. Yet, they still have to maintain a facade. They have to take care of their public image. And, and we very much understand that because we live on the opposite uh, 
part of that spectrum with heightened extreme attention to image and in a society the, the society of mass media first right think of the famous tv debate between nixon and kennedy and according to marshall McLuhan, kennedy won the elections also because of that debate where nixon arrived unprepared he was sweating uh, his his shirt he didn't have much of a neck his shirt was not really uh, he just got out of the hospital oh I, I don't remember that i didn't yeah, remember his, his that either he re hurt he re-injured it as he was coming into the debate you mean nixon yeah right what kind of injury do you remember uh, i think it was a leg a leg or knee injury specifically and then he kind of so he, his energy was affected by that he was and, having a bad time and kennedy was well youth, youthful well dressed with a, a blue shirt that came out nicely in a black and white tv in control etc projected a different kind of image and expanded his influence okay so it's a very it's a radical innovation to have someone who says it doesn't matter how much power you have you cannot apply that power all the time it's not economical it's not efficient and therefore you need the support of the people even if you're hitler you need the support of the people even if you're stalin you need the support of the people you cannot just put in jail every opponent or threaten every citizen put a cop at every corner to ensure obedience compliance with the rules you cannot in a modern society because of how things are interconnected and of course Machiavelli understood that because he lived in Florence he lived in a evolved well-developed mercantile society if merchants are not happy they're not investing in the economy of Florence if merchants are afraid of their future if merchants in Florence are afraid that a leader will take their money what would they do we find that in their journals they they suggest one of them suggested to, to his son put the money away in Genoa so no one will be able to touch it right so you have a stash that is out of reach for the local leaders so you need confidence you need hope in the citizens for society to be productive without that productivity power is dependent on the resources of society so it's a grandiose it's a new very modern conception of society and power which entails that no dictator no matter how much force they have can survive without influence and influence comes from their positive image so they have to build that and maintain that being duplicitous whenever necessary so we like the second paragraph and the second and third paragraph talks about the renaissance court and what's strange is that clearly these paragraphs are a reference to Baldassar Castiglione's treatise called Il Cortigiano the courtier published in 1528 after the prince probably the most famous treatise in renaissance culture in Italian renaissance culture and there are some Machiavellian elements in uh, Baldassar Castiglione's The Courtier, the idea that the courtesan, the, the person, the courtier who works at the court, uh, needs to be subtle and he, the, the, his end game is to influence the leader. And everything you find in here is about that kind of competition. Of course, I understand why they put there, because it's easy to move from this kind of situation to an office situation where the king is the boss where the courtiers are the employees at various levels who are competing with each other to get the attention of the boss and competing to influence the decisions of the boss and therefore be somewhat uh, gain the gratitude of the boss and be rewarded with a bonus or a promotion but again it's all framed in the form of a court and without reference to that book but clearly they had that book in mind and he likes that because the machiavelli's the prince is all about blood right and there are people that are hanged uh, people whose throats are slashed 
and he cannot, Robert Greene, be talking about force, but if you talk about Il Cortigiano, it's all about manners. So Il Cortigiano tells you, you need to be elegant. What's the way to be elegant? Sprezzatura, he calls it. Being cool is actually, Cortigiano uh, presents you the first idea of what it means being cool. Being cool is being elegant without looking elegant, right? Because if you're in other people's face, then you're not cool. What is the first law about being cool? You cannot say, oh, I'm cool. You cannot signal, I'm cool. You're not cool. The others have to be telling you, he's cool, she's cool, right? So even elegance is a game, but what's the purpose of elegance? To attract the attention of the leader, of the king, of the prince, of the duke, to be on his side, to be a model, even when it comes to elegance or when it comes to walking, he talks about walking, dancing, right? There are subtle ways to influence others. And it's not about force, so that's why right away the rest of this page is not about Machiavelli directly, but about another book from the Renaissance, okay? And if we read from page two, everything must appear civilized, decent, democratic, and fair, but if we play by those rules too strictly, we take them too literally, we are crushed by those around us who are not so foolish. And after that, you find the first reference to Machiavelli, the first direct reference. And yeah, th this paragraph is very Machiavellian, the beginning of this paragraph, but what's the missing element? It's the context. That is to say, within a specific context, you might consider that it is necessary to play a certain kind of game and others might not respect the rules. But it's not a universal law. There might be contexts where you have to go by the rules and there is no other way because other ways are not giving you control. And if you don't control the rules, if you're not the one setting the rules, then you cannot transgress. Then you cannot go outside of the rules. You have to go by the rules and find some other ways to control the context. But Machiavelli clearly will tell you, do whatever is relevant in that context. And given a certain context, you might have to consider that rules don't apply to the control of the outcome. Okay? And therefore, you may have to play a dirty kind of game. So, this is fine, but has to be rephrased from the point of view of Machiavelli. It's not as simple as, you don't play by the rules, I don't play by the rules. No, the question is, given this context, the context of this game, the specific context of this game, is the observance of the rules relevant for the control of the outcome? If it is not relevant, forget about the rules. You would be bringing in an outside element that is completely relevant to the end game, to the end result. That's the way you approach this, and then you understand the complexity of Machiavelli, which is not simply, oh, forget the rules. Just do whatever you want. Nah, no, no, it's not that. Okay. And of course, the, what, what I've marked in here is all about influence, right? Influencing other people. Then there are a couple of paragraphs where basically he's talking about non players. That is to say, there are people who are uh, signaling their virtue, if you, if you will who are saying I'm not about power, uh, and I'm not about deceit, etc. But again, you understand this kind of reasoning, which stops, uh, goes only so far in being Machiavellian, only if you understand that within each context or ecosystem, control is limited, right? And therefore, you have some of the control, a slice of the whole pizza, or two or three, there is a finite amount of pizza available, of power available. Therefore, 
if this is your approach, this is your view of the situation, of a context, of a game, known players is not a concept. There are known players in a system, in an ecosystem. Everyone is a player. Everyone is, who is active in the ecosystem is a player. So even if you declare, I'm not trying to get power, I'm trying to give power away to others, you're still playing the game. In one way or the other, you are playing the game within the context. Again, Green's analysis is limited insofar it doesn't bring the consideration that the power game always have a, as a context, and within that context, there is a certain amount of power. You can very well give it up, but are you really giving it up, or is it an illusion, like a con, where I, th where I say, you're in control. But I'm really controlling the game because I'm implying you have to play by these rules. And therefore, I'm trying to control the game as, even as a non-player. Okay, so I'm trying to direct your attention to how much of Machiavelli there is in here and what is missing that would make this a better, more authentic application of Machiavellian laws. I'm skipping to page four. This is something that Green insists a lot. In fact, at some point, he'll write a book on this, on mastering your emotions. He even recently wrote another book a few months ago that I haven't read yet. I think it's called The Daily Lives, where this concept is very strong, master your emotions. And again, he's one who's trying to, he's thinking from his own personal perspective. And something that is, uh, good about Green is that Green doesn't have a, a real sense of what is normal. So everything looks new to him. When he finds, when he discovers something about society, about relationship, it's an incredible discovery to him because he doesn't count as a natural understanding that would happen to a, a regular-minded person, a neurotypical uh, person growing up. And so he has this freshness, this enthusiasm. So master your emotions. Now, this is somewhat Machiavellian, right? Because Machiavelli says you have to appear good if it is necessary, you have to be violent if it is necessary. Both in the case of Green and in the case of Machiavelli, the basic objection, the basic criticism is, where's the switch? Where do I access this switch where I'm not emotional? Oh, I don't, I'm not emotional. Here, no emotions, back, fine. There I am, have a meeting, I have to present, I have someone hostile around the table, let me pull the switch. Oh, there is no switch. The same goes for Machiavelli, when Machiavelli is talking about violence and necessary violence. So if this leader needs, by necessity, in some situations, needs to kill or have others killed is this something that you can do only whenever necessary? Nothing personal, as they say in the, in the movies about uh, organized crime. This is, not, this is business, not nothing personal. Clearly, there is a cultural limit in Machiavelli. And the cultural limit is that Machiavelli, like someone from the 16th century, fails to understand what Freud will understand, the unconscious the deeper effects of violence, right? Because we know now uh, from all kinds of literature, personal reports by soldiers or policemen, as well as psychological articles on psychology, that even a soldier who goes to a just war and thinks that his violence is justified, even a policeman who is supported by society in his use of violence, will suffer the consequences eventually. It's hard to escape post-traumatic stress disorder. It's hard to imagine that you have a switch. Now I'm violent. Now I'm home. I'm a father to my kid. But earlier this afternoon, I, I was shooting at someone, or I was beating up someone, right? Or I spent six months in Iraq, Afghanistan, and then I come home, and I go to the supermarket, and everything is normal. Eh, not exactly. So this is the limitation in Machiavelli. It would be nice if I were one way or the other by necessity, according to need, as needed. 
now I'm duplicitous, now I'm in control, now I'm lying, now I'm cheating, or, or, and, and I, I can continue. Then I can switch back to being honest, authentic, etc. Uh, doesn't work that way. Okay. And again, look at stories. Ever since the Civil War in the United States, we've had stories, for example, written by snipers. So people who've killed hundreds of people, even though at a distance. And their description of their reaction, of the impact that this activity had on them. Even though, again, they felt entitled, justified in their actions, they couldn't escape the consequences. Or, or read what people such as Colin Powell have, have written about the baptisms of fire, the first time you find yourself as a soldier under fire. You've been trained and trained and trained, and, and then you're in a real battle, and Colin Powell will, will, uh, would say to you that most people would just freeze. First reaction, you, you're completely paralyzed uh, under this fire, no matter how good your training is or your mindset, how appropriate it is. Okay, so keep that in mind. Let's see what else. And, and the same thing in here, talking about love and affection, but it's the same kind of imaginary switch. And Machiavelli has this primitive, rudimentary, Renaissance idea of human nature, which was established on the foundation of the Greek or Roman culture. This idea that you have the fox and you have the lion. The fox is the uh, intellectual nature in you, the spiritual nature in you, and the lion is the brute in you, the animalist animalistic version of you, the animalistic side of your nature. So your mind and your body, your planning and your violence, your mind and your muscle, right? And their idea in, was that the mind was in control. That the evolved mind of the Renaissance man would be able to control the animal, the lion, in them. So unleash the lion, kill that person, lie, and then bring it back. Bring it under control. This was their model of human nature. And, and this duality for them was easy enough to reconcile by developing higher intellectual skills, of course it's an illusion that you can control. And Freud will be about that, that you can be the best. His clients were all members of the bourgeoisie, right? The clients of Sigmund Freud. Yet they have these impulses which were very much base, very low uh, kind of impulses that they couldn't control and they were seeking for, for help. And psychoanalysis can help you, but again, not even psychoanalysis will uh, help you uh, that, that much. Um, and once again, a reference to uh, appearances and how you, uh, you, you really have to take care of your image and you have to uh, Use deception, and, and the problem is still the problem of tr managing the shift, shifting from one thing to another. Still image, image, and the idea that power is a game is good, right? Because we want this idea that a game is limited, right? You sit at a table with cards, and you play by the rules only within that context, then you stand up, you move away, and those rules disappear. So this is a good metaphor to understand the idea of control within an ecosystem, but Green doesn't move full way into the direction of Machiavelli, understanding that the game is always changing, and the context is always limited. You cannot be playing cards through your life, uh, although there are uh, anecdotal stories of people who entered into a relationship and continued to play mind games. I'm talking about Dungeon and uh, Dragons players who were so much into their games that even after they got married together, they continued to play with each other because at the table they would be 
opposed to one another in games that could last months or years. But those are extreme examples. But you have to understand that when you start considering the outcome, you have to look at the context. What is the context? Now, because it's a process. It's not an entity. And that was the end of this. My arrows here want to signify, look at the boundaries of the context. What are the boundaries, right? What is the limit, space, time, intruders, part a porous boundary or part of a larger context? Unless you do that, you end up with a pseudo Machiavellian game where you're doing what Machiavelli would, would never do, giving universal recommendations. And Machiavelli will say, I cannot recommend anything. You could win by being cruel. You could win by being honest. You could fail by being cruel. You could fail by being honest. It's not about that. It's about the interaction of skills, behaviors, and a particular context or ecosystem. Okay.